wonderful. Thank you again, Kevin. That was absolutely delightful this morning. Uh, church, if you don't have one of these little booklets, hopefully you've been taking it every week and you've been filling it out, but there are in the back area, for those who might be visiting with us, we have a little booklet for you to follow along with our message and so that you can kind of get focused. And there's also cheat notes in the back there. If you missed a week, pick up the week that you missed and you can fill out the rest of your book so you've got it complete. All right, I don't know why I'm grabbing my pen, but I'm ready to get to work here. All right, sounds good. We're talking about diversity. In our White Flag series, number five, so if you could turn your books to diversity, uh, I want to read a, actually I'm just going to put a scripture on the screen, and it's Luke chapter 9, verse 23, and it's in my translation, all right? So Luke 9, verse 23, mine translation. You got it there? It's just a photo there, Andy? I don't know if you got it there. Okay, that's my, trans, that's my translation of Luke 9, 23, all right? Basically... I surrender all. That's been the heart theme of this whole series, a surrendered life, white flag, hence the white flag. And thank you again, Ray and Marion, for setting up our white flags, and they're absolutely great reminders. But I'm going to do a little test here. Now, you've, you've, you've had some inspiration this morning. I'm not going to sing, so I'll just read some words. But I'd like you, at one point, I'm going to point to you, and I want you to sing with all your heart what you think might be the next words, all right? All to Jesus, I surrender all to thee I freely give. I will ever love and trust you in your presence daily live. That did not sound like you were singing. I think it worked. You know that song. I surrender. There's the words right there on the screen. They were on the screen. I surrender all. That's a really hard one, isn't it? surrendering all. Today, particularly, this message is going to require all of us to surrender to God. Good to hear you all, whether you sung on tune or not. Uh, that's all right. We're good. But I want you to look at Revelation chapter 7. You don't have to sing anything more. Are you ready for this? Do you want everything God has for you today? Do you want everything that God has for you today? Yes. All right. So look at Revelation chapter 7, verses 9 to 17. Who has a Bible who's ready to read this? Who wants to read it up front with all of us here? I saw that hand, Mark, but I think it was premature. Who would like to read this scripture today? Oh, Jackie. Very good. Jackie, come on up here. Revelation chapter 7, verses 9 to 17. After these things I looked, and behold, a great multitude which no one could number, of all nations, tribes, peoples, and tongues, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed with white robes, with palm branches in their hands, and crying out with a loud voice, saying, Salvation belongs to our God, who sits on the throne, and to the Lamb. And all the angels stood around the throne, and the elders and the four living creatures, and fell on their faces before the throne, and worshipped God, saying, Amen, blessing and glory and wisdom, thanksgiving and honor and power and might, be to our God forever and ever. Amen. Then one of the elders answered, saying to me, Who are these arrayed in white robes, and where did they come from? And I said to him, Sir, you know. So he said to me, These are the ones who come out of the great tribulation and washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Therefore they are before the throne of God and serve him day and night in his temple. And he who sits on the throne will dwell among them. They shall neither hunger any more nor thirst any more. The sun shall not strike them nor any heat. For the Lamb who is in the midst of the throne will shepherd them and lead them living fountains, lead them to living fountains of water. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Beautiful. Thank you, Jackie. What a beautiful portion of Scripture. Don't you find it interesting that Revelation 7 describes this incredible worship experience of heaven. It's not at the end of the book. You're thinking Revelation 22, 23, that we have 
I love how the Lord orchestrated this text before we see the very end. In other words, God's got this in mind already. He's got these ideas set one day and two day. God wants us to be a worshiping people. The expression in this text, the diversity in this text, the, the sh great shouts of joy and the worship and adoration of the Lamb, all of it wrapped up in a beautiful few verses together. This is a foretaste of what heaven's going to be like. I think earth, we need to get ready. Come on, people of planet earth, you're still part of this, this earth here, right? Check your pulse. Yeah, you're still here. So in the meantime, I think it's time to practice because this will be our story one day. We'll be around the throne worshiping the Lord. Isn't that a beautiful thing? I read a book in Bible school by A.W. Tozer. And A.W. Tozer uh, book, The Knowledge of the Holy. Isn't that a good Bible school that they would include that as a text for your study? I thought so. It was an amazing book. If you've never read it, let me encourage you, let me encourage you to read this beautiful book. It's a, and there's a profound statement right at the beginning of this book. And I'll read this to you. What comes into our minds when we think about God is the most important thing about us. Worship is pure or base as the worship entertains high or low thoughts of God. For this reason, the gravest question before the church is always God himself. Who is he? How do you view God? How do you see the God that you serve, the God that is center in your life? What is your view of God? So if we look at Revelation chapter 7, verse 9 to 17, we see an incredible description of who God is in the place around the throne. Now, don't miss the point today. We're talking about diversity, and I will get there. But in my estimation, one of the most profound Christian thinkers of our generation, uh, Dr. Miles Monroe, you may have never heard of him, but he's a powerful, powerful speaker. Uh, he passed away a number of years ago, but he's quoted as saying this, when purpose is misunderstood, abuse is inevitable. In other words, you will always intentionally or unintentionally mismanage what you misunderstand. Powerful. Therefore, the enemy aggressively attempts to get us believers to operate in a place of ignorance, particularly when it comes to even worship. Scripture says, Hosea, my people perish for a lack of knowledge. I want you to be okay with the term ignorance. I'm going to call myself ignorant today. I'm going to call you a little ignorant today because none of us know everything. Would you agree? There are some things in your life that you're ignorant of. Let's just admit it. Come on. Turn the person beside you and say, I knew you were ignorant. Go ahead. No, I'm just kidding. Don't, don't, don't do that. In fact, our identity is placed in a world of diversity. I went to... Western University, first time I ever went into the Western University Library at Hobart's, I believe it's called. I went to the seventh floor, and there's many floors, and I looked, I got off the elevator and I went, ah, I'm stupid. All the knowledge and all those levels, I wouldn't even have a fraction of knowledge that was in one library. How many people can agree we're a little dumb? We're okay. We're sheep, right? We're okay. We're okay with that. So don't be insulted when I call you ignorant because we all are in some way or another. I want you to be okay with that term because it also will help you understand to describe the certain areas of your life, specifically as we're talking about worship, um, in this one area today, we don't have time to go in all areas, that we don't know everything. It is used in our societal sense, in the, in the culture around us, as a derogatory, as a condescending term when somebody is called ignorant. But the truth of the matter is, when the world does that, they're actually doing that out of ignorance in a condescending way. Because it's not conflating ignorance with intelligence. And I'll say this. Intelligence deals with your capac capacity to comprehend the thing. Ignorance is simply dealing with the information or truth that you have or have not been exposed to. Would you agree with that? This means you get me the information and I'll get the revelation that will cause a transformation in my thinking about something. I just need a little bit more information. How many people would agree 
that reading the word, you are being transformed by the renewing of your mind as your ignorance diminishes as the truth of God takes hold of your life. Would you agree that is true? Now, when it comes to diversity in worship, we might not think, we think we've got it all understood. I want you to hear what I'm saying now, that the enemy understands and so aggressively attempts from the very beginning when he was in the heavens with God as one of the archangels, where he always wants to assault who God really is. And the enemy wants to continue to keep us either uninformed or worse yet, misinformed about things. And being misinformed is more dangerous than being uninformed because at least when you're uninformed, you know you're ignorant. When you're misinformed, you're not only ignorant, you're also arrogant. So let's go to the biblical truth today. In your notes, you'll see this. Here's the biblical truth we're going to unpack. The way that you share truth, understand truth, receive truth about your faith, about your walk with Jesus, will either, when it comes to dealing with people, will either incite a confrontation or invite a conversation. So how you handle truth is really important. As we see the Bible, how do we bring forth the truth that's in the Bible that creates more conversation? How people know we need a little bit more conversation? We need more tables than we do fire and brimstone off of pedestals in downtown. And if that's your ministry, God bless you. I have no idea what you're doing, but God bless you. We need less pedestals and more tables. Would you agree? So corporate worship, this is it here, reflects the beauty. Everybody say beauty for a second. Beauty. Say it one more time. Yeah. That is really important. Corporate worship should reflect the beauty and the diversity of heaven. You might not think that way. The great Puritan, John Owen, wrote, Unless men see a beauty and delight in the worship of God, they will not do it willingly. I love that. The beauty and delight in the worship of God. Let's talk about the Lord's Prayer for a moment. We had that beautifully sung this morning. Thank you again, Kevin. That was so timely. Um, he had no idea that I was preparing, and then when God spoke to him about that song, fits so well with this message today. But when we look at the Lord's Prayer, prayer and praise have similar ideals. So the Lord's Prayer as a prayer, but also as a song of praise to our God. Thy kingdom come, the beauty and the diversity of heaven. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. So what God has for us, what he wants for us, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So the idea, the idea is that God's church, his people, would invite the presence of the living God, the kingdom of God would manifest, and it would be beautiful, and it would be diverse in the earth. Now, you might not think that's a big deal, but let me talk to you about this next thought that's really important. You might not agree, but there needs to be unity in diversity. You're not always going to agree with me. I don't always agree with me. My wife doesn't agree with me sometimes. I think that she's probably right, but I'm not going to admit it. How many people, even your spouse, you're not always in 100% agreement? Anybody, any marriages here? Where, is, Kath, is Catherine and Dave here in church today? I think they're here today. Are they somewhere? Where are they? They're in the balcony. You guys, like, today, happy anniversary, 29 years old. Let me ask you a question. Do you guys agree with each other 100% all the time? <laughs> Notice Dave said nothing. <laughs> but we can have unity in diversity. Whatever I misunderstand, I mismanage. Mismanagement is not always the wrong utilization of a thing, but can also be the underutilization of a thing. When it comes to worship and our relationship with God, oh, this is, excites me, we can get caught up with our own experiences, with our own explanations, and it becomes all about us again, as opposed to when in reality, here's what you need to look in your notes here, we've all been purchased to glorify Him. See that in your notes? That's the word glorify. We've all been purchased to glorify Him. This comes from 1 Corinthians 6, 19, 20. Do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you've received from God? Amen, that's wonderful. You are not your own. 
Oh, here we go. You were bought at a price, therefore glorify God with your body. Your body is deeply connected to your worship in glorifying God. Your posture, your attitude, deeply connected. So glorify God with your body, with involvement, engagement, being intentional about your worship. You can't just, catch, oh, yeah, I love you, Lord, whatever. How many people know that's not worship? Yeah, God, yeah, big guy in the sky. Hey, thanks. I mean, cute, but stupid. That's not worship. But our, when we tie our physicality to our theology, hear me out here, we will bring God glory with our bodies. Look at your voice. You sang wonderfully today. Many of you can sing amazingly. Me in the front row, we're just, I'm singing solo. So low you can't hear me. Look at your lungs. God gave you incredible lungs to worship him, to the breath of God, the ruach of God, so that you can sing and declare praises to God. All are connected to praise. Every breath you take, every move you make. Oh, that's a wrong, wrong song. <laughs> Let me say this. Your body is a designating chamber. The winds, the pipes. You know, Lucifer in heaven was actually instrumental in how he was created. So I'll say this. You might find this weird, but you are the music. Your life expressed, how it is, how, whatever way you want to, you are the music. I want you to look at the next line here, the next thought in your notes. See diversity that God has made. I want you to see the diversity God has made. We're gonna, I'm going to give you three illustrations on the screen. They'll be brief because we don't have time to unpack them, but they're incredible. Number one, I'm going to show you the world map of the diversity. Here's the world. And look how many people live in China and India alone. Practically three billion people are either Chinese or Indian of origin. Can you find Canada in that map? It's just a sliver there in that North American blue area. We're just, we think we're the center of the universe, let alone the center of the world. Are you kidding me? There are more Asians and Indians than the rest of us. It's unbelievable. So God created such diversity in how he made peoples of the world. Anybody from Asian background, just kind of give a little yoo-hoo, just family heritage, any Indian background. I'm telling you, my community, everybody, that uh, Tim Horns is from India. I'm having the best of time. Uh, my best man in my wedding was uh, from India, and so when I was say, hey, the guy that delivered stuff from uh, to the front door from UPS was from India, and I'm going, hey, this is, and I'm having these conversations with all these people from India. I love India. My wife and I sponsor a little girl in India. We have for many years. We, we have a heart for the people of India. And I'm glad they're showing up in my neighborhood. I'm glad I'm being served by people in my community who are from that background and heritage. To be honest with me, with you, oh, to be honest with me first, but to, I'll tell you what I'm thinking. I think it's beautiful. I think God's doing something to Canada that is absolutely delightful and beautiful. If that makes you nervous, you need Jesus. Because I think God wants to show us the beauty and diversity. Let me throw another. Diverse ages. So the world is mostly young. There's a lot of kids on the planet. There's a few of us in that upper echelons of people. But in the 8 billion... By the way, this week, the world turns 8 billion people. This week, or kind of next week, we're not quite sure how many people die and babies are born. So it's, it's in this week-ish time. Definitely before November, they said. But of the 8 billion people on the planet, a whole bunch of these people on the planet are really, really young. See the diversity of ages in the world? It's amazing. And in your world, you might only see people of your age. Wherever you go, wherever you hang out, they may be like, oh, man, the world's like me. No, the world's actually very different. Look at the next one. Diverse bodies and people and young people. And I read earlier at the beginning, the Lord is good, his steadfast love endures forever, and his faithfulness to what? all generations. Come on, church. We want the next generation to be as excited about Jesus as we are, do we not? 
Uh, people know those kids, those Gen Zs, those millennial kids. How many people, they're a little different than us. Poggers, bussin', fire. Like, they're saying stuff I'm going, am I being sworn at? They're actually thinking I'm awesome, apparently. How many people have no idea what I'm talking about? Wave your hand. Yes. So you're older than the kids. That's all I'm saying. But I want you to see, for all of this thing, for the multitude around the world and the ages and the diversity, I want you to see the price that Christ has paid. That's in your notes. I want you to see the price that Christ has paid for all peoples. He shed his blood for every sinner. Would you agree with me? He shed his blood for every sinner. You see, it just at the right time, when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous man, though for a good man, someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us, Romans 5, 7 to 8. He shed his blood for every culture. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 17. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins in accordance with the riches of God's grace. So we bring our differ, diverse experiences, our diverse backgrounds and upbringing, and God loves us and forgives us, all of us equally. God cares for a wounded and flawed and fragmented humanity, and forgiveness and mercy Meets us like an unforeseen kiss. And I was going to go kiss somebody, but that would be really weird now. I was going to kiss my wife, and she's not here, so you're spared. <laughs> Hebrews 13, 12, and so Jesus also suffered outside the city gate to make the people, that's important to pay attention, holy through his blood. What people? All the peoples of the earth. He wasn't crucified in the city just for the Jewish people. He was crucified outside the margins for all people to have access to. Jesus died on the cross. Calvary, Golgotha, was outside so that everyone gets invited in. It's a good thing. The cross was actually the first evangelism tool that Jesus used to go out into all the world. There are 7,000 people groups who are still unreached. 7,000 people groups, cultures, Still unreached. An unreached people group, a UPG they call them, is any distinct ethnic group that is less than 1% Christian. There's an estimated, listen to this, 11,300 people groups in the world today. Each distinct from one another by virtue of their culture or language or geographical location. Of those, about 7,000 fall into the category of unreached. How many people that is just staggering? They have no Bible in their language, no churches in their communities. Most have never heard of the name of Jesus. Maybe God, but not Jesus. Romans 1, verse 16, For I'm not ashamed of this good news about Christ. It is the power of God at work, saving everyone who believes, the Jew first and also the unreached people groups. So, he shed his blood for every ethos. The meaning of ethos is an ethnic group. This is where you get the word ethnicity and ethnic group. And ethnos is a diverse and rich heritage. Rich in history, rich in language, rich in music. Unreached groups get discovered and they've got their own music, their own rhythms and beats. Because God puts it in all of us. You ever see a little kid put on a music, a little radio station, a little stereo, and they, you don't have to tell them to dance, and they're like busting a move. And some of you are looking like, I don't like rap music. It's okay, I'm not saying bust a move means rap music. How many people drive down the highway, and you're like nostalgic? You hear a song, and it brings you back to a time when you were a teenager. Dun, 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 dun. Come on, who knows that song? I just gave you a couple beats and you were brought everywhere. Music brings you to a place. Every ethnic group has their diverse expression of sound. And Jesus highlights this in the end times, Matthew 24, verse 7. For nation ethnos, ethnic groups will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom and there shall be famines, pestilence, earthquakes in diverse places. 
verse 24 or verse 14 of the same chapter, and this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all cultures and ethnicities and ethnos. And then the end shall come. How many people know we got work to do, church? If there are 7,000 people groups unreached, how many people know missions is still a priority for God? Is this on, Jacob? I was expecting an amen on that one. Thank you. It's enough. Folks, it's pertinent. It's really important for us to understand that God loves ethnicity and he loves ethnic groups. And, and at, the end, at, the, at the root of that word ethnos means we find, all of us find our place. So he died for every, he shed his blood for every ethnos. There are 3,969 languages still have no Bible. Do you believe that? Wycliffe Bible translators revealed in 2019, around the world the Bible has not, has not been translated into 3,969 languages. So 1.5 billion people do not have access to the Bible in their language. How many have a Bible in their language? How many have two Bibles in their language? How many have a dozen Bibles in their language? Hmm. So as of September 2020, the latest stats, the full Bible has been translated into 704 languages and New Testament into 1,551. I want to tell you a testimony. I was going to bring him up today, but he's busy ministering to people who just came to Jesus and are now coming across the border in Windsor. This is Ahmad Galjay, one of our beloved families of this church. You can't read what's on the left, can you? That's Pushtun. And Ahmad has translated, for the very first time in the history of mankind, the entire, all four Gospels. And Timothy, I think. And Philippians. And working on something in the Old Testament. For the very first time in the Pushtun language. Do you know what he says when I say, that's amazing? He goes, I'm grateful to God for the opportunity. Every time grateful gratitude fills his heart that he's used of the lord to come on church this is happening in bethany every week down underneath that section of the church right there we have a little studio that goes live broadcast into afghanistan and iran and places in the pushtun language every week church we're reaching and he's right now ministering to people who've come to jesus through his broadcast his live internet broadcast he's meeting them in windsor with a couple other people from the jesus network why I couldn't be here today. Come on. Isn't that a beautiful thing? That's part of our story. It's not just Ahmad's story, so give God praise for that this morning. We've all been sanctified, and I'll switch gears here, because all these things showing a diversity of what God wants to do in the world, but can I tell you, all of us are in that place. We've all been sanctified to thank him for all the good things he's doing in our lives. This is why God said in Psalm 50, verse 23, let me read it, the one who offers thanksgiving as a sacrifice glorifies me. Thanksgiving is a part. All the good things that God is doing, all the diverse things that God's doing in the world today is a way, is a wonderful opportunity for us to give him praise. So when we think of our praise, you know, whether it be, you know, the love or our joy we have for God, all of that is so true, but it's limited because the ultimate expression of worship is found in thanksgiving and a thankful heart for all that he's doing, all who, all who he is and all that he has done. So we expect, expect true worship, if it's diverse enough, to be characterized by different ways we express thankfulness. I think thankfulness is the highest form of faith, to be honest with you. When you thank God before you have your prayers answered, God, I thank you that you've, you're in control. God, I thank you that you're answering this prayer. That is the highest form of faith, that you're already giving him thanks, not after he's finished answering your prayer. Let it, let's be a church that thanks him before he even shows up on the scene. Let's be a thankful people. This is why we have Thanksgiving, to remind us that we're not really good at remembering to thank him. And I pray that just gets inside of your heart and your DNA, that you pay attention and with intention, uh, because it's essential to your true heart of worship to be a person of Thanksgiving. There are times when we are, we, we long to be entertained, and that's okay, but the church should never be an entertaining enterprise. 
It should be a place where we're entering into his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. That every time we gather, Jesus is glorified and he's exalted and that he gets all the attention and our praise has great intention. Thanksgiving honors God. Do you believe that today? Can we enjoy worshiping God? Absolutely, we should. But I want to give you just a bullet, just run through this bullet, bullet, bullet point here about diversity of worship and how we, why we actually can be a people that are thankful. Number one, we have his promise. He's going to meet with us when we worship, when we give him thanks. God is infinitely generous with his presence. God chooses to respond to our worship, and he promises to commune with us. Give him praise for that. Always wants to show up. He is a great redeemer. Redeemer of all peoples. Far beyond your social circle, God is doing a great and mighty work. And hallelujah to his name. Psalm 96, verse 6. Well, let me read this to you. Splendor and majesty are before him. Strength and beauty are in his sanctuary. Ascribe to the Lord, O families of the people. So not just the peoples, but the families that are within the peoples. Ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord the glory due his name. Bring an offering and come into his course. Worship the Lord in splendor of holiness. Tremble before him all the earth. Look at the diversity of expression. I want to highlight splendor and beauty. Splendor is multiple, like a, fa- you know, like a diamond that has multiple sparkles. It's splendorous. I don't even think that's a word. I'm going to, that's a, that, saving that one. That's mine. Don't steal it. But the splendor of the radiance of God's glory. We also have a new song. We love our old music. We, whether it's centuries old or just a few months old, the tunes we enjoy the most are unavoidable, the ones that we, we really like and we really know. And there's no getting around it. We're all like that in some way or another. Music has a strange power to capture thoughts and feelings from the past. I don't know about you, but it, it does that for me. Whether it's recent or long ago, and it sends me right back. Just like smells. I smell a pine wood campfire. It brings me back to a Boy Scout days. Just like that, when I was a stupid kid. What am I doing? I'm thinking about being a Boy Scout. You know, smell, but sound, song brings me back just as much. And it's a common experience for all of us to be brought back in some way to a song that you've sung for years, whether that's a Christian hymn or a chorus you've just learned. Like this morning, that gratitude song. Thank you, Josh, for bringing that song this morning. Woo, that's going to be my new favorite. Love that gratitude song. But I'm not aware, so we sing the new songs, and so we love the old, but let me just, let me just help us here a little bit. I'm not aware of any command in the Bible to sing old songs. It's not disobedient to sing old songs because we should sing old songs. On the contrary, it's simply something God doesn't need to remind us to do because we love those songs. But he is saying in multiple places, three times in Psalms where it says, it starts with Psalm 96, 98, And 149, it says, it begins with, sing to the Lord a new song. Isaiah 42, Psalm 33, 3, another place in 140. There are dozens of places where God is actually telling the people of God, sing new songs. But I like my song. Doesn't matter. Sing new songs. Can't wait until the babies of this age right now are growing up, and who knows what their style of music is. Oh my gosh, I can't figure out what's going on now. I don't know what I'm listening to. Anybody like that on the radio and listen to the modern hits? Go, what, what is that? I have no idea. Is that rap? Is that hip hop? Is that rhythm and blues? Or is that garbage? Or is that, you know, <laughs> blues? I, I, I'm confused. Anybody else kind of like figuring it out with? Wait till the babies grow up and they're going to be rebellious. All right, we got our own music and all the kids right now are looking at those young babies and going, oh, those kids, they don't know good music. The babies have got new tunes coming. Get ready. Oh, my goodness. But if we take our cues from the worship of heaven, we're going to be okay with it. Because in heaven, the book of Revelation, there's, there's a foretaste of the feast that's to come. We read it earlier. 
and there's a blend of the new songs and the blend of the old songs all working together to give God glory. And it's Psalm 89, 1 says, Sing of the steadfast love of the Lord forever. We're going to be singing that tune forever. And Revelation 15, verse 3, is told to sing the songs of Moses. You conquered to be, sing the songs of Moses. What's the song of Moses? It's an old song. And then later on, Deuteronomy, it's found in Deuteronomy and Exodus, the old song, we're going to sing that one in heaven. You think your song's old. Wait till we start singing Moses' song in heaven. I don't know what that sounds like. Probably a tambourine. I have no idea. How many people love the tambourine? I just insulted you. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry, Jackie. I used to do that with, you know, the he i i i yo but I can't do that in Kitchener. I can't make fun of that. No way. Kawartha's maybe, but not down here. It's wisdom. Yes, thank you, Ray. But it leads me to this next song, this next line. We all have been led to worship him. The song is just a vehicle. We have always have a choice in how we voice our frustrations and doubts. Or when we go through a season of pain, I want to speak very specifically to that today. Turn your pain into worship, your, your problems into prayers. Let praise be the way out. Let praise be the way out. Lament can be worship if, it's, if your gaze is lifted upward. It's okay to lament. But if you're just telling your buddies, you're just commenting. You're not lamenting. But if you tell the Lord, it's lament. So what we get now is he is our ever-present help. This is amazing. Maybe people have got musical backgrounds, but I just discovered this this week. For the director of music, that's this verse, for the director of music of the sons of Korah, according to Alamoth, a song, God is a refuge and strength and ever-present help in trouble. See, that's a song right there. God is our refuge and strength, ever-present help in trouble. I don't know if this is a real song, but according to Alamoth, who knows what Alamoth is? Like, I'm looking at that. So here's the definition of Alamoth. So the director of music is, is pulling the people, the sons of Korah, according to Alamoth. Alamoth means giggling girls. It's weird. And goes on to say, is the joy that comes when little girls are happy. So next week, we're going to be all giggling girls. Just kidding. But that's amazing how that would be encouraged or included that even the little kids can find a place to say God is our refuge and strength and ever-present help in trouble. Which brings me to the last script. The last thought here is he is our eternal hope. Amen? He's our redeemer. So we're going to lift our gaze to him. As a worship team, you guys come on up here. We've got a few things we're going to fill out while they're preparing to close this morning. And amidst the singing, even this morning, perhaps now, there was a whole lot of other songs being sung. There were songs of pain this morning. There were songs of suffering. There were songs of doubt and fear, songs of desperate need. You didn't hear it coming through the microphones but it was coming out of your own heart. And God shows up in the midst of a diversity of need. There's not one person in this room that's going through the same thing another person is. God knows how to meet you in the diversity of your need. Some are struggling. And Josh did not know this when he prayed for finances. And the Lord spoke to me. There are some people who are having a really hard time giving God praise and thanksgiving because you're really in trouble. But the highest form of praise is thanksgiving that God is in your life. But the resounding theme of every one of our songs was, I pray that because he's our eternal hope, that we simply were saying we need to behold God. So here's, church, we, we got some work to do. We have a task at hand. Let me give you these last, the bottom line. We need to get educated. Remember about informed or misinformed? We need to get educated on the global perspective of worship. 
it's huge, greater than the expression that we know. We need to get enjoying. Come on, this is going to be a bit of a hard one. We're going to get enjoying the different styles of worship that divide us in the church. We're going to learn how to enjoy one another. My little grandsons love Paw Patrol. I hate Paw Patrol. But they enjoy it, so I'm going to enjoy it with them. I'm screaming, yes! Do I want to watch Paw Patrol all the time? No, but I enjoy my grandkids. We need to get engaged in the joy of continual worldwide worship. Pay attention, church. We need to get excited in the love God has for each of us, and we need to get enthralled with the global mission that God has called all of us to. Amen.